<laughs> Today we're lucky to have Pamela Ranuk, who is professor of plant pathology and in the um, Genetic Center, Genome Center at UC Davis. Pam, thanks so much for being here today. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. So you'll be talking today in a symposium here at FSE on tomorrow's table. And I thought maybe to start, you could just give us a sense of the, the theme of the main points that you were hoping to get across today. Well, I wanted to rush through about 10,000 years of plant breeding and then spend a little bit more time on modern genetic technologies such as genetic engineering and CRISPR-Cas9 technologies. So you mentioned the long history um, of, of sort of genetic modification of plants. You've actually now had a pretty substantial 30-year history in the field, going back to your days <laughs> as a master's student at Stanford, I think, back in the, in the mid-'80s. Um, and I'm curious for your perspective in terms of seeing all the technologies come along um, over time, including the transgenic technologies, which you've really been active in. Um, where are things now in the field in terms of your, what are you excited about? Um, do you think the prospects are, are particularly good or, or less so than they have been in the past? Um, yeah, I, I, I did start here, and I was really lucky to work with Ginny Walbutt in corn genetics, so it really got me very, very excited about plant genetics, and actually that's what launched me into graduate school and a lot of the things I'm, I'm doing now, so it's great to be back. Um, so what plant genetics and genetics in general has been um, really accelerating in terms of the kinds of technologies that we can use, um, interpretation of results, computational aspects, and I think what's really exciting is that there is such um, an abundance of different types of technologies, uh, but I would say that we still have just so much to learn and so, so many challenges because it's still not obvious for example, how to develop crops that are resilient to climate change. And you know, across the field of plant biology, we can have um, successes in, in terms of whether it's seed, a new type of seed, or a new type of farming practice. But there's still uh, so many aspects that, that we need to address. Uh, and so I, I think what's changed about plant biology since I was here 30 years ago is that it really has become truly interdisciplinary. So you have the technologists that are developing new sequencing techniques. You have the computational biologists that are working on sort of predictive biology approaches. Um, you have quantitative geneticists that are looking at um, associations of genes that confer a particular trait. Um, agronomists that are moving towards large scale sort of precision agriculture and imaging. Uh, so there, there, there's a lot of um, different types of technologies all working towards the same goal, which is to uh, enhance sustainable agriculture. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about rice maybe for a little bit, because you have spent a lot of your career uh, specifically on rice, working on disease resistance and um, submergence tolerance. Where do you see um, maybe specifically the most exciting sort of pathways forward in rice right now? I mean, I know there's been a big expansion of hybrid rice um, in, in many parts of Asia. Certainly the, the sub-1 genes that you've been active with are really gaining hold in a lot of Asia. Um, what do you see as sort of the things you're really excited about in rice in particular? Well, I think that um, rice, as other crops, uh, there's a lot of uh, new technologies, such as CRISPR technologies, that are allowing us to really you know, query gene functions, so just at the fundamental level, um, trying to understand uh, what makes a plant tolerant of stress or disease. And there's much more uh, efficient and sophisticated approaches to trying to understand what those genes do. And then there are groups all over the world that are sequencing a very large genetic diversity of rice that is allowing us to um, more carefully bring in genes that can have um, very profound effects for, for farmers. What are your thoughts um, in particular on golden rice in, in terms of the, the, the history of that and, and sort of where that's heading? Yeah, golden rice has is, is been really fascinating. So I was part of the Rockefeller network in the early days, which funded um, Ingo Petricus and, and, and Bayer to, to work on this, and they, they really made impressive 
results with developing um, golden rice, which is a rice that has higher levels of um, uh, pro, uh, pro vitamin A, I guess you could say. And it's been very interesting politically as well. You would think that, well, you know, developing a rice that has higher contents of um, vitamin A that will help um, children that uh, something like 500,000 children are vitamin A deficient, that, that, that one would think that that would be embraced. Uh, but there's been a lot of sort of political controversy about it, which surprises me as a, as a geneticist and a parent. Um, and it's been a bit slow. I mean, I think that one of the issues is that the cover of Time magazine's already probably been more than than 10 years uh, about golden rice, but I understand that just recently the field trials in Bangladesh are, are looking very good. So I think um, that type of fortification is, is going to remain to be very important. And I, I think the, the primary controversy was really about the genetic technology because it was genetic engineering. If it was developed through another technology, it seems that there, there would be less concern about it. Um, I think that it's very clear now after 30 years, 40 years of genetic engineering and plants and medicine and bacteria that, that it's, it's, it's as safe a genetic technology as any other type of genetic technologies we've been using. So I hope that um, that, that golden rice will, will move forward and get into the hands of, of children and mothers that, that need it. So one of the, I think, remarkable things about your career, at least from my perspective, is, is you've maintained a lot of really excellent science, but you've really been, I think, a force for communication of science. And now you have this Institute for Food and Agricultural Literacy. Um, and I guess I'm curious just sort of um, what, what do you think was it about you that really drew you to, to taking, you know, I think most scientists would, would sort of do their part, but they wouldn't really take it on as a really big effort, but you've written books with your husband, you've given a lot of public lectures, and, and from my standpoint, they've been really effective, but I'm wondering just initially what, sort of what motivated you to do that? Well, thank you. I, you know, I think it's, um, my father's a refugee, so he was 12 years fleeing the Nazis, and I think that kind of goes through the generations that you realize you need to, to, to speak up, um, and uh, actually what catapulted me into a little bit more into communicating science was the Iraq war because I felt that um, it w was very clear the experts were predicting that, that it was not a great idea to invade Iraq and I, I felt very frustrated at that kind of misinformation and that, um, that countries would take military action based on very skimpy types of evidence um, Anyway, don't want to get into the politics too much there, but I realize I'm not a foreign policy uh, expert, uh, so I can't really do anything about that, but there's a lot of misinformation about food and agriculture. Um, and my husband's an organic farmer, so we, we were often asked about organic farming and plant genetics, and we felt that the information out there was not always so accurate. Um, and so that really, we just thought, well, we'll, We'll write this book, and that then we we started moving into a lot more types of lectures and and, and things like that. So it's really just an um, interest in food and farming and and information. And I think now with the uh, election in the United States, there's a lot of attention now on fake news and misinformation. But I think as a scientist, at least some of us in different fields like climate change or vaccines or plant genetics, we have been confronted with this kind of fake news and the harmful effects of it for a really long time. And, and so I think for me, I really care about plant genetics and agriculture, but I, I feel it's even a much larger global problem that we really, as a scientist, it's, it's one of our jobs is to communicate what we do and explain the scientific process, explain what is evidence-based decision-making. Uh, so that's sort of what drew me into it. And, and, and you may need to cut some of that out, we'll see. <laughs> no, I think that was great. I, I'm, I'm curious in terms of your experience in communicating, and I guess I have a hypothesis for you, which is that in, um, 
in, in communicating to sort of students, they're very receptive to facts. And often, um, I think the younger generations sort of have maybe changed their position on, on a lot of things as they learn about them. Um, I'm not so sure about the older generations, but, but one of the hypotheses is that I think the, the gap between the scientific understanding and the public understanding uh, on genetic resources in particular and genetic techniques, although it is still wide, it has been shrinking a little bit over the last few years. Is that, is that just a hopeful uh, view of things or is that? That the public understanding is getting better, getting do you better mean? Getting better slightly over time. Yeah, I, you know, it's, it's really interesting because it kind of goes in waves. What I've noticed is that um, 20 years ago there's concern about safety and then that just sort of went away because it was so clear every major scientific organization explained again and again there's no enhanced risk of this kind of technology and it sort of went away and then it moved to sort of um, environmental concerns but now the issue of food safety has come back again and it's um, it's a lot about marketing so it really depends I think on the community so it's it's it becomes kind of a um, you know, a tribal, mm -hmm. sort of a, a tribal issue. If your friends reject climate change, well then often you reject it as well without really um, perhaps understanding all the issues. And I think as scientists and educators, we, we could do a much better job. It's hard with the internet. It's really hard for the public to get accurate information. And, and one slide I was going to show today, I have all these acronyms of all these major scientific organizations and, you know, their major conclusions. But acronyms are um, kind of boring unless you're in the field and you know what the National Academy of Sciences is. You know the World Health Organization. And instead you have all these colorful uh, figures and people um, that are sort of providing fake information because usually they're trying to, to sell something. And... As a consumer, it's very difficult to, to distinguish that, I think. So I don't know if it's, if, um, I, I, maybe your question is, are, are people more trusting of, of scientific evidence or well, in general? I, no, not in general. I think yeah. that's, a, that's a huge issue that, yeah. that we could spend a long time on. I just, I think that some of the resistance or maybe some of the appreciation of, of let's say, transgenics or other types of, um, genetically engineered products, the, the, there's been more appreciation for the benefits, uh, benefits of it recently, and maybe more appreciation that some of the, the risks um, are not as large as people initially feared. Yeah, I think that if you, if you have a, a really good discussion with somebody, you, you're very specific about what you're talking about, I think that, that there are many people that can say, oh yeah, I understand if you have a genetically engineered papaya and that it it, it's no longer susceptible to infection. That makes sense to me. I think one of the difficulties is this term GMO, because it means something different to every person. And there's actually no definition by the FDA because um, genetic engineering or moving genes around is not really, um, um, GMOs sort of refers to, to, to everything. And so I think unless we, we talk about a specific product, or a specific effect, so BT, which is organic um, insecticide that's been very helpful for organic farmers and is a really big benefit um, for genetic engineering and reduction in the use of insecticides. I think people can understand that, but when they hear GMO, uh, GMO cotton, it, sure. it, it's meaningless. They don't, they don't perhaps know that it means that farmers are reducing the use of insecticides. Yeah. So just a final question, going from the broader public to um, students who are really interested in this particular field and trying to make a contribution like you have over your career. What, what do you tell students like that in terms of the skills they should be developing or the things that they should be looking at? I, um, I think that students that are studying what they really love are headed in, in the right direction and um, meeting people and mentors and uh, being open to learning from other people is is fantastic and I think also to not limit yourselves I mean I, I think I sort of saw myself as a, a scientist and um, I was actually we were invited to write a book by um, uh, Cornell University Press and I thought no I, I'm not a I'm not a writer I'm a scientist I, I can't write a book They're like she yeah, write this book and the editor kept coaxing us for two years so then we did it we wrote a book I'm like oh 
oh yeah, we, we are a writer. So this is not kind of, um, it's surprising how much we limit ourselves. We put ourselves in a box sometimes without realizing it. And it really is fun to do other types of things because you meet um, uh, other very knowledgeable people that can really help inform what you know about a particular subject. Great. Well, Pam, thanks so much for being here, and we'll look forward to your talk later on. Thank you.